everyone. Welcome to Shannon Q. Thank you for joining us today. I am super, super extra ultra excited about this conversation because it is one of my favorite subjects to discuss. And when I saw that Eric had a discussion on, on a radio show, which is linked in the description to, to his channel, go check him out. Um, I couldn't wait to approach him to find out if he wanted to come have a conversation with me about it. So we are going to talk about philosophy of mind and whether or not we have souls and I'm jacked up about it. So just a few little housekeeping things. We are going to follow the format that I generally follow on the show, which is we'll talk for probably about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how selfish I am. And that varies. Anybody who watches this show knows that sometimes I'm selfish and monopolize the conversation. And then we will take questions towards the end. We don't take questions as we go. Uh, if you send a super chat, it will aggregate. If it's mean, it will not be read. But thank you for the donation. And if it's, uh, if it's contributing to the conversation, I'm happy to read it or critical feedback for each Either of us happy to read that as well. Uh, my mods are in the chat and everybody be good to each other. We encourage discourse here, but we do not accept or tolerate uh, personal attacks. So please be kind to each other. It's not something I generally have to worry about because you guys are <coughs> awesome. So before we get into it, I'm going to let Eric introduce himself. Eric, tell everybody who you are and where they can find you. Uh, yeah, first, uh, thank you for having me on. It's an honor. I appreciate that. And uh... Um, it's not always I look forward to discussions with non-believers, but there are, are a handful of non-believers who I, I can trust it, that if I talk to, it's going to be a genuine good discussion and conversation. So I appreciate your demeanor and all these things. Um, so my name is Eric Hernandez. Uh, I am the apologetics lead for the Baptist General Convention of Texas um, that just encompasses basically I'm a full time apologist uh, for the Baptist Convention in, in Texas. Um, it's it's a dream come true kind of a job. Uh, that's a whole testimony uh almost even sob story to some extent of how I got there. But um, that that's what I do uh, for a living. And it's something that I feel blessed to do. And having discussions like this and discussion with people like yourself is always something I strive to do because whether or not we just we agree at the end of the day, it's important that we have these kind of dialogues so we can at least understand each other better. And I think that makes for some type of progress in, in many areas, even if it's just having better conversations with each other. Yeah, no, I know. I you're not going to get any, you know, pushback from me on that. That's essentially what I stand for. It's kind of why I do what I do so that we can demonstrate that it's possible to have better conversations about contentious issues and recognize the humanity in each other while we're doing it, as opposed to looking at each other as, you know, adversaries on a battlefield. Um, so I'm pumped to have this conversation. I'm going to, I'm not going to, without further ado, I think we should go right into it because there's so much to cover. Um, yeah. So we discussed ahead of time um, that, <coughs> how what a good way to start would be for you to essentially give your definition of what a soul is and then I'll kind of talk about my idea of what you know the idea of self is or consciousness is and then we can go from there because I have some questions that stem, stemmed from your radio interview and I feel like that'll just lead into a lot of conversation sure. so uh, are, if you're comfortable like what's a soul yeah <laughs> yeah so um i would define so I'm a, what's called a substance dualist which means that in a nutshell, I could say that human beings would would consist of uh, two types of substances, a physical matter, which is the body, and then an immaterial substance, which I would say that's what I am. So, and I'm, I'm, I'll give the definition once I kind of give this groundwork. So when I, when I use the word I, that's an indexable word that refers to something. Much when, I, when I say here or there or that, it's an indexable word that is pointing to something. When I use the word I, I am talking about me, the self, the conscious subject, and I would say that I am a soul. So literally, technically speaking, I wouldn't say first I have a soul. I would say I am a soul, um, and I have a body. So I have a body, but I am a soul. I don't have a soul. A body without a soul is a corpse. Uh, and then here's where um, I like to get my money's worth because I actually changed my position on this because I do have a soul, and it's a Kia soul. It's orange, and it's parked <laughs> in my driveway. Ah, of course you do. <laughs> And I bought the car just so I can make that joke when I teach this stuff. And it's, it's worth every penny. Um, uh, so uh, that aside, um, that being said, so the soul I would define as an immaterial substance that contains consciousness and animates the body. That, that, that'd be a good working definition for now. There's, there's deeper parts to it, but that's a good start. And then uh, consciousness, I would say, is, is a faculty of the soul. Um, okay. and we would define consciousness uh, in five different states. It's something you define ostensibly. So when you use ostensive definitions, for those who don't know, uh, it would 
like if I asked you to define the color purple, you would have to do it by pointing to something that's purple and it would take some type of an experience. So you can't describe the color purple to someone who's born blind because they've never had an experience of purpleness or what purple is. Mm -hmm. So in the same way you define consciousness that way and that it, that comes in five states. Just like water could come in three different states, consciousness comes in five states. And those would be thoughts, uh, beliefs, sensations, desires, and volition, or you could call it acts of will. Okay. So you see, I heard you say that you had a soul, <clears throat> and forgive me, but so what do you think a soul is, though? So, so to me, uh, I heard, you know, that there's different states of consciousness, but I didn't hear what a, what a soul is. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I probably just... I probably just said a lot too much too quick. Oh, so, that happens to me all the time. I never shut up. <laughs> so I would, uh, so I, I am a soul and I would define a soul as an immaterial substance that contains consciousness and animates the body. Okay. So, okay. You did say that. So a soul contains consciousness and animates the body. It's an immaterial substance. It's an immaterial. Okay. So now to me, I maybe we're, uh, actually, I don't know if we are close, because <laughs> to me, that seems like an extra step, right? So we could just say, like, you could take soul out of that equation and just say, I am consciousness and that animates my body, or like, I am my consciousness, because that's kind of, that's kind of the way that I see it. I see, which, it's my turn anyway, so I should, <laughs> I should do this. Um, I see what it is to be me, because there's an arguably something that it's like to be me, right? Like, that that is what my consciousness is it is what is, it is like to be me now i compile that based on you know my previous experiences my sense of self awareness the fact that i have thoughts that i'm aware of the fact that i'm aware of anything at all now i i'm able to make an inference that because you know you're like me and you're able to articulate that you have experiences that are similar and we can have conversations where we understand each other that you would have something that it's like to be you as well so that that's something that's consistent between humans for sure because we're able to articulate it and we could get into animals later but for, for sure humans because we're able to communicate and understand and articulate that now i see that in and of itself is a beautiful wonderful complex and almost a difficult to explain thing because i i agree that there's a problem with you know uniformity of like where a soul might reside and that's a complex discussion that within the physical physical matter of your brain but i i see the soul as an unnecessary extra step above consciousness that um just adds a layer of unnecessary complexity uh because consciousness itself i think is a, is enough of a stopping point does that make sense sure okay because yeah. so, i ramble <laughs> so do you have any feedback for me? Since you're a guest here, why don't, why don't you uh, give, give me some feedback on what you think and we can go from there rather than me just challenging. Yeah, so, so, so a few things here. So I, what you touched on. So a reason I would, I would reject that type of view okay. of just, so, well, well, let me ask this first for clarification. Sure. So are you saying that's what a soul would be in your opinion? It would be just consciousness? Or are you saying that's what you are? I don't even Leaving think the question of soul aside. Yeah, I just, I don't think that the soul is even necessary to factor into the equation. Okay, gotcha. So, so, um, so the reason I wouldn't, I wouldn't just reduce myself to just my consciousness is because, so let's suppose, so you, you said that you are, you know, your, your, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, your compilation of experiences and memories and whatnot, but yeah. suppose God forbid, uh, well, let's not use you, but suppose, you know, John Smith, he, you recognize him by his characteristics and who he is and etc cetera, etc cetera. but suppose god forbid he gets in a terrible car accident and has a, a, a some pretty bad brain damage and when he comes out of this coma that he he got in from this he has different characteristics has no memory of his past doesn't recognize his wife or himself mm -hmm. is he still john smith so this gets into the question of identity through change so if he's nothing more than merely reducible to his consciousness then you'd have to say no that John Smith ceased to exist and a new person who looks just like John Smith mm -hmm. came into existence. Now, I would, I would say that'd be ad hoc and necessary. But if he is the same person throughout change and part replacement, new memories, old memories, gone, etc., then there's something that has to go beyond consciousness that would underlie that change throughout these uh, interactions. And I would say that would have to be something like the soul. And uh, if I could just go a step further and say we can apply the same to the body. 
Um, Because when we use the word I, what are we referring to? I say a soul, and I say the soul contains consciousness, and that would mean it's not my body because if I chop off my arms and legs, I'm still Eric. So having arms and legs is not necessary to being Eric Hernandez or being me. So that's why I would say the soul would be necessary in that aspect to explain these things given the fact that we have identity through change. Okay. So there's two things that I wanted to address in there, give for one for each scenario. And both of them kind of tie back to the same thing for me. So your first scenario, the guy that got into a car accident and, you know, is, is he still John Smith? Now, I would ask him, like, so f- fundamentally everything about him has changed, right? So does he still consider himself John Smith? And that would be the answer to that question for me, because if he no longer considers himself John Smith, his consciousness has been fundamentally augmented to the point that the, through a trauma to his material brain, so, thus that he, w- what constituted him, and the only, the only reason we have a self is because we recognize the self, is no longer present. It's, it's changed. It's just kind of housed in the same look, the same physical <clears throat> body. Um, the second one about the cutting off the arms and legs, I mean, yeah, obviously you're still going to be a person. Like if, if I cut off my finger or any component of me, I would still be Shannon. But if I had severe brain damage or you removed one physical component of me, my brain, then I am no longer Shannon, right? Or if you damage it to the point that it no longer functions, then I'm no longer Shannon. So the, it gets to me, it gets back to what constitutes a person. So what constitutes a person there? There's a physical instantiation. So like we move around in space, we can see each other, like we have physical bodies. But you would agree, or at least it sounds like you would agree, that our physical body isn't what makes us us. You, except for you would say the soul is what makes us us, and I would say the brain is what makes us us. Did, okay. did I help to – does that make sense? Do you feel like there's anything that I'm missing out on there? Um, well, I mean, I, I get it. That you, I, I would disagree. I'll start by saying that. But well, yeah. yeah. It, it did. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> So by by does that make sense? Yes, you are you articulate your position. I I, I, I hear where you're coming from. So uh, I think I think there would be a few problems with that. And, and okay. here's where I, I would I would touch on. So there's a difference between asking the person, "Are you still John Smith?" versus the actual answer to whether or not he is in fact John Smith. So you have the question of a perspective versus the ontological reality of whether or not he still is John Smith. Mm-hmm. So I would say asking him wouldn't get the job done. Uh, that wouldn't be a, a good way of Can I ask of a clarifying not- question before you go on? Because I'm not sure I understand. This is just me mm-hmm. being philosophically dumb. So you're saying there's a difference between like the, what, what is a John Smith and what, and what John Smith thinks, whether or not John Smith thinks he's John Smith. Like yes. those are two separate questions. So yes. who determines what is a John Smith, if not John Smith? Right. Well, I, I think if, if I can answer that. confusing the... to me. <laughs> that's where no, it I, is. I, 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 yeah, no, totally. So in other words, it's whether or not he thinks he's John Smith, I would say is subjective. Um, okay. uh, because let, let, me, let me give you a, an illustration so maybe okay. you can see what you think about this. Okay. Suppose, okay, suppose he gets into this car accident or whatever and whatnot, and he loses his memory, and you say, are you John Smith? He says no. But let's say about, you know, after a few weeks of therapy and even counseling, he actually gets his memories back and he says, you know what, I actually was, I am John Smith. And in fact, I was John Smith the entire time. So which one is correct? I think you have a few options. One is John Smith ceased to exist. Another John Smith came to be. And then the old John Smith came to exist for a second time. Or he was, in fact, John Smith the entire time. What would you think? Uh, I would say that he was some version, I guess, of a John Smith, potentially, because you, I, I don't see the self as a consistent, like fully and wholly consistent um, property. Like you and I will change our mind on something, right? Like I'll have a perception and that'll change the way that I view the world. I'll learn something and that changes the way that I see things. I'll I'll understand things differently. I'll grow. I'll learn to behave differently. All of those are components of who I am and my personality and my and my sense of, of who I am. 
Now, those are subject to change. So if what, what you're saying is he was John Smith, didn't think he was John Smith, and then thought he was John Smith again, that would mean to me that there was the potential for being John Smith that was somehow mentally suppressed so to the point that physiologically he wasn't he wasn't able to be aware of it anymore um <clears throat> but did regain access to it physiologically would you okay. would you see it as different like that he had a soul and then was somehow disconnected from his soul and then got a soul back in that scenario like i feel like maybe we see things the same or maybe we don't um, see things the same way there well well so i i think I think what you just said is is what I would agree with and what I was getting at, but I uh, and I but I think that sounds different than what you maybe initially said, unless I misunderstood you. So that let me explain that. I just I just so, never stopped talking. So <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's fine. This is this is good. Mm-hmm. So you said perhaps he was John Smith, but not aware of it. So that's kind of right. brings me to the first point I brought up: whether or not he's aware of he of the fact that he is John Smith is irrelevant as to whether or not he is John Smith, which means. It's possible to still be John Smith in spite of not having those same memories and lacking the awareness that he still is John Smith. So one's awareness of John Smith isn't a necessary condition for being John Smith in spite of losing those memories. So the question becomes, philosophically speaking, are what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for these kind of things? And when I use the word I, what am I referring to? If I'm referring to – go ahead. Oh, I'm just saying okay. I'm just nodding and listening. (laughs) I keep going. (laughs) Yeah. So – so if if um if we reduce the self to nothing more than you know the combination of thoughts and memories then technically speaking the moment you have another new memory so let's say we have shannon q with 100 memories and then after this we have shannon q with 101 memories are you still the same shannon q or did one shannon q cease to exist and no one come to be so the point there is that if there is something underlining identity throughout the change of these different additions or removals of thoughts and memories if there's something underlining it then that would be the you that is underlining the the these these changes so it'd kind of be the same with what you said if you chop off your finger you're still shining q well then why not apply that to memory so there would have to be something that is more than just consciousness that retains that identity to change right so i think i think i'm consistent here and i'll get back to the chopping off the finger thing i feel like we're going to go down so many different roads here but i love this conversation The memory thing is similar to me. So if I cut off my finger, my finger was a component of me. So I used it in my life. You know, I picked my nose, whatever I do with my finger. And now I don't have a finger anymore. I'm still obviously me. The same thing goes with memories that they're housed physically. Like we can look at the hippocampus and we can manipulate areas of the hippocampus and we can see that you know you're gonna lose memories as a reason that anterior grade and retrograde amnesia are things right so retrograde would be you lose your previous memory that's incredibly rare anterior grade is the inability to form new memories so like you they call it the fish like uh the fish experience right like everything's Mm. A surprise like you can only retain a certain amount of perceptions and then you like forget the, right yes exactly that's she has anterior grade amnesia so those, those are housed physiologically now i see the consciousness as the the fluid aggregation of all of those perceptions and memories throughout time via via chemical and uh electrical interactions in the cortical structures of the brain so you can taking away one memory which we frequently lose memories all all the time or adding a new memory because we frequently have new perceptions is just part of that aggregate it keeps rolling along now if you had a soul for example you would need to have an explanation for how the soul is aggregating these as well and i don't see a good explanation for how a soul would be aggregating them because you know if you if i lose a memory my soul would lose a memory if i Maybe less so for the finger, I guess. I don't know if souls have fingers. <laughs> but, like, but if I if I gain a perception, the soul gains a perception. Now, I understand that there's a, a difficulty in finding a unifying principle where a, where a sense of self is housed in the brain. But if you look at it as a continuous aggregate that has physiological components, that makes a lot of sense to me going the extra step. <clears throat> 
doesn't. Like, I just can't quite get there. Sure. So, uh, um, so, so a few things here. Um, and I, I don't, I don't stop me whenever you want. Cause like, oh, same with I, I do the same thing. Yeah. So I, I, I can talk a, a lot. So, um, so first recall that on my view, I am the soul. So when you say, if I lose a soul, does my, if I lose a memory, does my soul lose memory? Well, in my view, I am my soul. So when you say I lose a memory, you are in my position, literally saying my, me, the soul, the self is losing a memory. Um, okay. so to speak. Now, when you talk about aggregate, that that's, that's a really interesting point. If I may, let me, let me get, whenever I teach on the soul or, or if I were to debate the soul, uh, if I may give an outline of how I argue for the soul and that, that might help here. Okay. So there's two basic points I touched on. The first one is that consciousness is not physical, um, which would mean so that, so when you say something like this aggregate is what houses memory, I would disagree with that. Oh, I wouldn't uh, say it houses memory. Your hippocampus houses memory. I would say the sense of self is, is what we perceive as an aggregate. Our experience of all of those perceptual um, inputs being processed by the brain and uh, understood with uniformity. Okay. So, Sorry, um, didn't mean yeah. to interrupt. I just feel, feel no, like no, I, I, didn't, I don't think it's housed anywhere in particular. Okay. No. Gotcha. You don't, so you don't think memory is housed? Anywhere? Memory is housed. Yes. Right. <laughs> Yes, right. Memory is housed. So, yeah. so, so that's where. So I wouldn't. I would disagree. I wouldn't say that memory is housed in the brain. What? Uh, so my first. So yeah. So really? and, and feel free to push back in a little bit. So my my first uh, part of the, my case would be that consciousness is not physical, and I'd give arguments for that. Then my second point. Then from there, I would say, okay, but we know consciousness exists. Conscious states and properties exist. What possesses these things? Well, I do. Okay. So the next question is, what am I? And then my second point that I touch on in this cumulative case is that I am either a, what's called in philosophy, the fancy word is a mirrorological aggregate, or I am an immaterial substance. Um, and I would argue that I'm an immaterial substance, namely a soul. So consciousness is not physical. I am conscious. What am I? I'm not identical. I'm not merely a brain and body or identical to my brain and body. I am an immaterial substance, a soul. Now, I, c I can unpack that if you want, but that that's my basic outline. So I would disagree with kind of like the reaction you gave that memory is not in the brain. The brain doesn't sink. It's not the brain that thinks. It's the soul that sinks. But it does use the brain. There's a, a very deep correlation in there, much like a, a musician would use an, in, an instrument. I, I'm still a bit floored by the you don't think that memories are housed in the brain. I have some things to say about the other stuff. But, I mean, we can look at the research and we can – there's very – strong evidence that the hippocampus serves some function <clears throat> in uh, either storing memories or at least transitioning memories from short to long term. Um, and that you can, like, there's a reason that those types of amnesia exist, right? Because you, like, if you concentrate damage to the brain in specific areas, we can see that Mem th that memories dissipate like if you look at something like in alzheimer's for example when you have severe deterioration of the myelin sheath that surrounds your neurons you you start to lose memory for that reason i mean if if that neuronal impairment like that that loss of the myelination of that that helps you communicate from like the regions of your brain that store memory to the regions of your brain that you know process your conscious experience which i would argue would probably be more so prefrontal then um, where are they, if not in the brain? And why does that type of concentrated damage with, with a high degree of reliability result in the loss and damage of memory or the inability to, for, to <coughs> formulate new memories? Sure. Yeah. So, so good questions. Um, so, so a few things here. So when I say that I don't believe that the brain thinks or memory is stored in the brain, I'm not saying there's not a correlation. So there's different types of relationships between between objects and different sayings or different uh, properties. So, um, for to, to use the illustration, which you may have heard me use in, in that uh, radio interview you mentioned. Yeah, that's um, a great interview, by the way. I suggest everybody watch it. It's in the description. It's really interesting. Sorry, keep going. I'm really you. bad at interrupting, but it was. I no, want no, people no. to watch it. It was good. No. <laughs> Anytime you want to interrupt, to compliment me. You're more than welcome. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, so. Uh, if I grab a guitar, I'm not going to say that the note C is in the guitar or in a piano. Right. And it's not as if I break it. Right. So it's, it's, they're not in there. However, we know that there is a strong, highly verifiable correlation between the type of music and notes I can play with a properly functioning guitar. 
So when I say they're not in there, that's that's what I mean. They're not literally in there. Um, now, if I would argue that consciousness is not physical, which I, I, I could unpack if you want me to, but in other words, if it's not physical, then it's not going to be in the brain in that sense. And to ask where is it at is, in on my view, akin to asking, um, you know, give me the give me the GPS coordination address to where the number two is, and how many number twos can you fit in your pocket? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you're not gonna. That's that's not an unanswerable question, because they're constructs. A, a category fallacy is what I would say. Yeah. Okay. So, I do want you to unpack it in a second, but I, your guitar analogy actually made me think of something that, and I was thinking about this earlier, except for I was using a light bulb in my head as I was re-listening to you on the radio show. Like when you mentioned of like about the the bicycle, the tricycle turning into a bicycle, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking, you know, you were saying I'm not me. Like there's a thought is not identical to a material object, right? So right. But if I the analogy I had in my head in the guitar mode might be better, just because I have a guitar sitting right there and I like them better than light bulbs. Um, could consciousness not be something like that, like? You would say, you wouldn't say a, the sun is light, but light is something that's a, an undeniable property that emanates from the sun. Like a guitar is not music, but music is something that emanates from the guitar. Could consciousness not be something that emanates from the brain in the same sort of fashion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm fine with someone saying that, but I, I'd say a few, a, a few points to that. Okay. First thing I'd say is then you'd be a dualist like me, and I'd say welcome to the team. Uh, <laughs> oh, is because, that what that means? Oh, maybe I am. I don't know. Okay. Because you are, now, um, you are now positing or at least conceding or agreeing with me that consciousness is not identical or reducible to literally the same thing as a brain. So we're talking about two different things. Okay. Much like the sun and light is two different things, mm -hmm. consciousness and the brain are two different things. So, uh, so mm -hmm. I, I, on that point, I'd say, yeah, so now you'd at least be what's called a property dualist. So um, um, that you have a physical brain, then you have something like consciousness that is not necessarily the same thing as a physical brain. Um, on top of that, so uh, what you're, what, what you're referring to, well, let, let me t first touch on consciousness. So when you say that, and, and maybe you you were just talking quick, maybe you didn't mean this literally. So let me ask. So when you said we see that memory disappears, what do you mean by see? Oh, we, uh, like th via observation. So we, we know we can get somebody to recall something. They'll, they'll actually do these experiments. They don't really do them anymore, thank goodness. But they do these experiments with animals, for example. Like so, they'll do wayfinding experiments um, with with rats. Like they'll get them to memorize a maze, for example, and they'll be able to guaranteed a hundred percent of the time be able to navigate that maze without any issues whatsoever. They've got it down. Then they'll remove the hippocampus from the from a little rat and the rat doesn't even doesn't know what to do it's bumping into walls it has no idea what to do it's it can still operate so it can still eat it can still function it can like all of its base functions are there but it no longer has the memories of how to wayfind in that condition like that's one example there's a there's a there's myriad um experiments that find similar things there's also mri experiments that we do where we're getting people to remember things like we're, we're either getting them to think about something solve a math problem or recall a childhood experience and we consistently see throughout people that the regions like in the in the midbrain around the hippocampus and the hip like and near the hypothalamus are consistently becoming engaged as are the regions around them prior to the frontal lobe becoming engaged which means that we can see that they're housed there, uh, and if they are damaged later on down the line, they're no longer able to have that same sort of recall that they were previously able to do effortlessly. So that would tell us that there's a correlate that's a very strong one that would see consistently through with people that likely this is where your memories are, are kind of housed. Um, and the, in, in the case of Alzheimer's, the demyelination messes with the connection. So your memories may still, I guess, kind of be trapped in there, for lack of a better word, but aren't able to communicate with the frontal lobe so that you can process the fact that you even have those memories. And I talk really fast and I love psych research. So I'll shut off now. But that was my explanation. No. Yeah, no, so I, I, trust me, I talk fast. I have ADHD <laughs> and, and people point that out all the time. Um, <laughs> So, so I enjoy talking fast. Oh, good. <laughs> you can process it. it. Yes. <laughs> My manic so, discussion. So, so a few things here again. Um, 
so there's a different, like I said, there's difference in, in types of relationships between things. So you can have a cause and effect relationship and you can have an, a relationship of identity. So, and you can have even have dependence relationships. So for example, angles are not literally the same thing as sides, but you cannot have three angles without three sides. So while they're always going to coexist, it's not as if they are identical to each other, although there's a dependence there. Okay. Um, then there's a there's their cause and effect relationship. Like you said, you have brain damage and, and it affects memory. Or I break my guitar and I can no longer play the music. There's a cause and effect relationship, but that's not the same thing as identity. Identity is a one-to-one. -one. If I say Shannon Q is identical to, so that literally means in philosophy the same thing as. Shannon Q is the same, is the same person as the one interviewing me, then I'm using two different names to talk about the same person. So whatever's true of Shannon Q is going to be true of the person interviewing me because they're literally the same person. That's a relationship identity. Okay. So as a substance dualist, I have no problems with correlations, cause and effect, or even types of dependent relationships between the mind and brain. But I would, I would say they're not, this, they're not the same thing. Okay. So, and then if I were, it, again, haven't unpacked it yet, but if consciousness is not physical, um, then that's where I would, I would ask, that that's where when you say words like they're housed in the brain that's for me at least is like almost a red flag because like if i said if i said um my my phone is is in my car or housed in my car mm -hmm. or you know my bed is housed in my house you can go into my house and see it mm -hmm. when you say that about memory you couldn't go to the brain and see memory you can find a correlation in an after the fact, what's called a a posteriori way where you have to ask the person what it is. I, I use this kind of example. If, if let's say I, I was a neuroscientist and um, I'm, I'm looking at your brain and I say, okay, um, think, uh, Shannon, think of something, you know, something nice. And then I look at the brain state. I look at what neurons are firing. I look at what's going on neurologically. And I write down that brain state and I take a picture of it. And I say, okay, what were you thinking? You say, I was thinking of puppies and candy canes. I said, great. So I write down pup brain state X correlated with puppies and candy canes. I said, okay, let's try that again. And that's how I began to map out your brain. But the point there is, is that if consciousness were something physical, then I should be able to, as a third party observer, simply look at your brain and know what you're thinking without having to ask you. But I can't do that because I would say, argue that goes to show consciousness is a type of first person introspective awareness that is only accessible to the person having that. It's not a physical third party type of thing that we can just observe. But we don't know that for sure that we can't. <clears throat> we can't currently. But if there was a way to essentially interpret uh, neurological signals, by sig signals, I just pronounced that really weird, uh, neurological signals and um, figure out, you know, but like by what ratio <clears throat> of. Um, this would actually be really cool if they could do it, but like you could figure out what ratio of, of chemicals you had released in your brain, for example, your occipital lobe would be engaged because that's where um, you're, you essentially process vision and, and memories of vision. Um, I studied perceptual cognition and focused on vision because it was my favorite thing. So if you were eliciting a memory, for example, from somebody and saying, you know, think about this thing, if you could potentially, and they're, they're trying to do this to a certain degree, um, map out, how um, different images are are laid out in the occipital lobe based on a, a reaction in the midbrain when you're eliciting memories. It is conceivable that you could have some sort of image projection based on figuring out the correlates to map out that's an accurate representation. We don't have the technology to it, but theoretically it's possible and people talk about it all the time and it's really, really cool. So it depends on what you mean, I think, to me by... Um, like if I tell you to think of an, an elephant, right? Like you're probably gonna think of an elephant. We're both thinking of an elephant right now. Cause I said elephant. Now I can't see what the elephant that you're thinking of. Looks I actually like. didn't think of an elephant, you by what? the way. It's, Stop it. <laughs> I AD, remember I have ADHD. I can, I can listen and process without thinking of oh, in, in fair images. Enough. So. Fair enough. Okay. So if it, I was thinking of an elephant, but you don't know what my elephant looks like. And I don't know what your elephant looks like. So you're right there. Like, I agree with that. Like, there's nothing that we can do to, to look at that physical state and figure out how to translate it into what a thought experience is like. There's no way currently anyway, but hypothetically there could be. Um, but 
I, I don't see how that gets us necessarily to a soul. Like, I think I could pre- like agree with you. Like, it just intuitively to me seems like, yeah, you know, I can't hold a thought in my hand. It's not a physical object. Mm-hmm. Right. But so, that doesn't mean that it's not <clears throat> something that's um, emergent from a, a physical object. Okay. Right? Yeah. So, so, okay. So, so that last point right there brought up, brought up a, a can of worms for a, another type of discussion, which I, I'd love to get into in a, in a second, or at least bring okay. up a point. Let's party. Um, <laughs> so, so you meant, so you said it could be possible to translate. Mm. And, and I, I mean by that, and I assume you mean by that kind of what I'm saying, I think we're on the same page for what you said at the end. Yeah. It's not something physical like you can hold in your hand. Yeah. Um, uh, and the only way I would say we can quote map out the brain is by doing it the way I said, given the argument I gave, because consciousness is not a physical thing that you can observe in a third party perspective. It's like, if I looked at a piano, if I looked at a piano and said, um, what do these keys, what, what sound do these keys make or what note do these keys play? I don't play piano. So I'd say, I don't know. Yeah. Now, if you gave me, I, I don't know how long it'd take me, but if you gave me maybe a few hours or a couple of days, I could push everything, listen to the sound, and then write it down and map it out, come back a few days later and say, Shannon, guess what? I've mapped out this piano and correlated the keys and notes to which keys I have to push to get which notes to play. That's how we do it with the brain. I can't look at a piano and say, ah, this is what's going on. Uh, to, to kind of further that point, hypothetically, suppose there was an alien race uh, and they had a completely different type of composition and even maybe even composed of some different type of substance than we were. If you were to look at whatever type of brain they had, composed of different types of, of matter, you couldn't look at their brain and say, I know what they're thinking. No. And yet, and yet the interesting thing is that alien race could experience pain and I could experience pain. Mm-hmm. Same mental state, but different brain state. So, um, sure. so, so that, and, I, and I think, you, like you said, you were agreeing there. So I, just, I was just trying to just strengthen what – clarify, I guess, the point I was getting at. Now, you brought up an interesting point. You talked about emergence. Now, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would first still say that is a type of dualism, um, at, at least a property dualism. Um, I'll take your word on it. I'm not very adept philosophically, so <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and, and so when we look at the, uh, something like emergence, things that emerge are going are gonna to be something like a structural property. And, I, and I'm fine with emergence is just, we have to make sure we're not uh, positing something ad hoc, something that, that we're, and I'm not saying you are, I'm just saying that, you know, anytime we look at a theory or, or try to look at something, we want to make sure we're not trying to say this for the sake of not changing our position. Again, not that you are, you know, just explain what ad hoc is. So, okay. so if I were to get a pile of 10 wooden boards, mm-hmm. I would say that's a pile of 10 wooden boards. And I take those, that same pile of 10 wooden boards and I rearrange its structure and I can get a raft. And we can say, I now have a rack. That is an emergent structural property. So something emerges that's new based on the structure, you're still using the same pieces. I would say consciousness is not something like that, that you can rearrange a structure and something emerges from that. Um, what do you mean because, by that? Because that just seems like a reconfiguration to me. But like right. I said, I'm not philosophically adept. So when you say that we could reconfigure a structure and conscious doesn't emerge, like like going back to your analogy with the guy who had brain damage, we reconfigured his structure, like his physical structure, and something different emerged. Well, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say emerge. I would say consciousness was always there, so nothing's emerging. Nothing. Right. What, what's called but a different philosophy. version of him. I'm talking more about sense of self sort of stuff because I think that's the reference point we're using. <clears throat> Well, so, so when we're talking about emerges, we're talking about something new coming that had not been there before. Okay. So I'm not saying you can't have a correlation or cause-effect relationship, but you can only have a cause-effect relation if something is already there to begin with. If right. you get matter, let, let's just say that there is no God, and you just get matter, and you rearrange matter, at what point is, are you going to rearrange it, add more complicated chunks of matter, and boom, consciousness comes into existence? I would say that it is metaphysically impossible for that to happen. Really? So when why? Oh yeah, that's fascinating. fascinating. Why is it metaphysically impossible for consciousness to be a natural emergence of, of you know just by life existing? Uh, well, sort of so so because I, I, like I, like I'm I'm arguing here. I don't think consciousness is a is a something that you can get like a structural property. So oh, let me ask I'm you this: I'm misunderstanding that. I'm sorry. No, it's, it, is there is it ever possible? Let's say I get a, a red brick house made of a million red bricks. Okay. Is it 
metaphysically possible, physically possible, whatever you want to call it, to rearrange the number of red bricks, add or take away some rearrange the structure, and it becomes a blue house. Uh, not just simply by rearranging them. No, you'd have to paint them. Okay, sure, right. So you would have to bring in something new into the yeah. picture. Mm -hmm. So if it's not already there, so it has to already be there or be somewhere. I'm saying that's what consciousness is like. Uh, so when we talk about a conscious, so conscious properties would be something like intentionality. Uh, we say that mental states have intentionality. And that is a, an aboutness or an ofness. So my thought about my wife is about or of my wife. Uh, when I'm hungry and I think about food, my thought is about or towards something, but my neurons aren't hungry, right? My, my, my neurons aren't thinking about my wife. My neurons aren't nervous. They're not scared. I am. So I would say first that shows I'm not reducible or identical to this. And on top of that, I would say I don't see how that could emerge, how, how you can get conscious by rearranging these neurons or rearranging just – so Evan Plantinga gives an interesting argument where you take the base particle – let's say it's a quark and you get a million of those and you get uh, whatever the next step is. I have it written down somewhere. I don't remember my memory. So forgive me here, but let's say you get the next step up is like an atom. Okay. okay that, that thing's not conscious. And then you get billions of atoms and then you get the next step up. Let's say it's a cell and then you get millions of those and you get a neuron still not conscious. Then you get a hundred billion neurons and boom, presto consciousness. I, I I'd say it, it, it doesn't work that way. It's not an emergent type of property that can just come from just rearranging a structure of matter. Okay, so that's interesting to me. Now, like, I mean, the same same argument could be had about you know you have one like at what at what point does it become a table or a bicycle? Right. Oh, good. Right. Yeah. So you you have one atom <clears throat> that's potentially one day going to be a, a component of a bicycle or me or my computer or a light bulb or whatever. Sure. But at what point does it? It never is that one atom individually when you sure. look at it never is that light bulb. It's still one atom. It's, mm -hmm. it's the composite of all of those atoms that makes that light bulb or this computer sure. or whatever. So why, if it, it seems to me to follow that going through that argument, if one atom can eventually be a component of a light bulb, and we recognize that as a light bulb, why can't one quark, one atom, one whatever – all the way up the line, eventually be a component of a brain, and that brain produce some form of consciousness in the same way that light bulb produces some form of light. Right. So, so good. So now we would have to differentiate, which is how I get into my second argument when I talk. About, I mean, the second point of my case of the soul. And is just that to let I'm you not... know, before we we're, we're encroaching upon an hour because you're this, no you're, way. You're so freaking interesting. Yeah, we're in forty five wow. minutes, and we have questions. So I, I'm just letting people know we're gonna answer your questions soon. If you didn't send a super chat at me, I have to deal with the super chats first because they were kind enough to donate to the channel. So thank you. I appreciate you guys, and I love that you're interested. Uh, I'm I'm gonna let you finish, Eric. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to use a five dollar word, mirrorological aggregate. So what what you're referring to is, is <laughs> and, 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 and I'll, I'll I'll get I'll, okay. I'll get there in a second. So um, what you're referring to is is so you're basically kind of restating my case um, in, in, a, in a simpler way, which is good. I like when people can say things simpler than I can. Okay. So you're you're right. An atom could be part of a table, but note now you're talking about structural properties. Yeah. You're talking about getting something and configuring it with other things like it to get a structural property. So it's logically possible to conceive of a piece of wood becoming and be rearranged in addition to other pieces of woods to have something like a rat. But I would say consciousness is not the same kind of thing like a structural property. It's something what's called sui generis. It's something completely unique and different. Um, on, on top of that, I would say then we get into um, – the difference between an aggregate and a substance. So when we talk about myriology, um, you, you heard me mention this in, in, the, in that, that radio interview you're referring to. Mm -hmm. um, so aggregates are things like watches or cars or Legos. They're a collection of separable parts held together in a certain structure. Okay. And at this point, it, it, we're going to have to talk about um, – because you said, at what point does it become X, Y, or Z? Yeah. So now we're talking about the nature of something. So when we look at aggregates, they're a collection of several parts held together in a certain structure. 
the best I'm trying to think of how, how to summarize this and make it because, again, I can talk a lot. So if I were to take a, a, a car, which is an aggregate, it's a collection of several parts. Yeah. Its nature is such that if I took the tire off of the car, the tire would still remain and exist as a tire, which which tells us that its existence and identity as a tire is independent of its connection to the car. But the problem with aggregates is that the same is not true when you reverse it about the whole the tricycle example you mentioned yeah a tricycle if i took a wheel off a tricycle it becomes a bicycle which means for aggregates for for purely physical objects um then its identity its nature and and its um its existence is ontologically dependent on its structure and its parts now contrast that with the substance so traditionally living things are 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 paradigms for substances so I'm a substance, you're a substance. Um, and for substances, it's the opposite. L- uh, allow me to use a big word here and I'll unpack it. So for substances, the whole is ontologically prior to the parts. And here's what I mean by that. I as a whole, Eric Hernandez, exist ontologically prior to um, all my parts being formed. So it, we can think of like a, a dog. When you see a dog is born, its eyes aren't fully developed, ears aren't fully developed, but it's still a dog, which means its existence and identity is not necessarily dependent on its parts. It exists ontologically prior to its parts. It's actually what gives rise to its parts. Um, and if I cut a dog's tail off, it's still a dog because again, and as I mentioned earlier, it's not, it's not necessary for it to be a dog. You contrast that with aggregates, it changes the whole thing. It's the complete opposite. Its existence and identity is necessarily dependent on the parts. Second thing I'll say, and I'll shut up. And then you said, so at what point does it become X? So this is interesting because when we talk about natures, there are things that aren't intrinsically, for example, what is a table? Well, I would say there is no intrinsic tableness to something we would call a table because if I, let's say, um, let's say I have a desk at home, right? And I'm using it and, and it's my work desk, but then I, but then someone brings me lunch and I put food on it and now it's a table. Yeah. But then I also want to take a nap, so I throw a pillow on there. Now it's a, now it's a bed. That is because purely physical objects, part of their existence and identity, aside from the structure and parts, also come from the arbitrary external uh, functions that we give to it. So it's technically not quote its nature to be a table. It's the function that we apply to it externally. Now contrast that with consciousness. That's not the same thing. There is nothing. I am conscious, even if you don't externally. Uh, uh, grant that I'm conscious, know that I'm conscious, or or believe me that I'm conscious. It's it's completely irrelevant to anything external. It's something it's something that has intrinsic relationships. Contrast that with something like a table. It's something that we externally put onto it. Money, um, you know, is 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 valuable, but why? Well, because we say it is, right? It it has functional value. Um, at one point, toilet paper was more valuable than money, or hand sanitizer was more valuable, than money, right? <laughs> that might be um, our currency in the future. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Or I can get a plastic card and, you know, it it has certain value or I can I can push a few buttons on PayPal, you know, and you can donate in the super chat, you know, and there's value there, but it's externally imposed, not internally imposed. So if we're if we have internal any internal type of intrinsic value, if consciousness is not something that you externally give to me, then automatically it's disanalogous to compare that to a take to compare consciousness and me, the self, the soul to something like a table and an atom. But there's something that is there that, like, whether or not we label it a table, it still exists, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that to me, that just seems, you know, human centric. Like we call it a table. The reason we call it a table is because we've assigned it some sort of utility, and we and that right. utility is something that we affiliate with tables. So things that look similar to it or serve sure. the same function that it serves, based on our internal <clears throat> construct of tableness, uh, right. we're going to. A, a, attribute the designation of, of table. You are, we, you are table because I'm utilizing you in this fashion or you look something like this thing that I'm familiar with. So I get that. And obviously you can't do that for your sense of you because you're like, I'm not dawning onto myself and nobody else is dawning onto me what it's like to be me. It's, it's a solely individual experience that only I can have, only I can be aware solely, of. Solely, yeah. yeah. So- <laughs> <laughs> solely yes it's a solely individual experience only i can have only i can be aware of and only i can really really to, to any extent no so i agree with you there but i don't see how 
it's analogous because it's like going back to the table. There is still something there, whether or not we are mm-hmm. giving it an arbitrary designation, <clears throat> like couldn't or, or what we assign to it, utilize it for, say it is. There is still something that it is. So couldn't we just rawly exist in the same way that there is just something that it is to be a me in the same fashion that there is just something that it is to be that object that I've determined is a table. The only, the only fundamental difference being that, and it's an important one that this is incredibly complex and nuanced, difficult to assign, difficult to determine what it even is. And, um, clearly more complex than a table is i mean i don't know maybe tables have really complex thoughts i don't know i don't know what it's like to be a table i've never been a table <laughs> but, but i like but you know do you, do you see the point that i'm driving at though that i do, I do. yeah okay um, like so, i said i'm so not philosophically sound and i will answer your question soon guys i'm sorry i'm being selfish again go ahead eric <laughs> so so you're bringing up really great points and you're asking exactly the right questions and and the reason I had brought up what I did bring up, it was to your point that you said, at what point does it become X? So, so yeah. my only point there was that, well, it doesn't become that technically. It's just what we assign to it. Oh, and I'm saying that. that's disanalogous to consciousness. No one assigns to me consciousness. So right. but in other words, it's disanalogous to compare that like at what point. Um, now, it's funny because you said, what is it like to be a table? That is a profound, well, not table, but so Thomas Nagel, who's an atheist philosopher yeah. of mind, Ask the really profound question, what is it like to be a bat? So when you say, what is it like to be a table, I'm thinking of Nagel. And, yeah. and uh, there, there's – philosophy memes are incredibly great. Like it's God's gift to us. Uh, there was a meme that said something like – it had a guy like – he looked like a you know fresh out of college kind of young guy. And he said, I love philosophy. Uh, one time this guy asked what it's like to be a bat. He did a lot of research. And at the end of the paper, he said, I don't know. <laughs> it's like – yeah. Uh, that's an interesting book though. And it goes like the, the woman in the in the black and white room too. Like that's another right. interesting Ma- analogy. Like you know, Mary's you, room. You mm-hmm. know everything that it is. To Like she spends her entire life studying everything that there is about the color red. Like so she right. knows everything about the waveforms <clears throat> and how we perceive the color red. But she's never seen the color red. And – she goes outside and sees the color red for the first time. She's like, oh, there is something that I didn't know. Like, now I don't, yes. like, I really didn't know anything. Like, those are interesting questions, but they, like, yep. none of them get me to a soul, though. They just get me to, sure. I don't really know what consciousness is. I feel as though we can see correlates that are very clearly defined in the in the brain in the physical brain we can augment the brain and alter those states that's something that's clearly the case um but the to me it just seems like it's an extra step that's an unnecessary one because the questions are still interesting sure we're not going to answer them today but like what like why why do i need the soul so so yeah so so what we've been focused though admittedly what we've been focusing on the entire time so far which is fine with me is consciousness yeah. which is an aspect of the soul um now if if i'm correct in saying that the to brain you. cannot <laughs> to, I'm, I'm sorry? to you it is to me it's just you know that's the buck stops at consciousness with me right oh, right sure yeah, sure yeah, yeah. so yeah. But now if i'm correct that the brain cannot house consciousness nor possess consciousness mm-hmm. then what is possessing consciousness it must be something non-physical mm-hmm. um to, to, to put it this way, if I can touch on some metaphysics here. Sure. So properties and states, um, uh, uh, properties and states, when they're instantiated in the world, are possessed by something. Here's what I mean by that. Okay. So re- a ball can possess a property of being red, but redness doesn't just like float in the world by itself. So if I were to drive on the highway, I'm not going to say, oh, my gosh, I'm, g- I'm really scared of hitting the property of redness. Instead, I'd be cautious of hitting – uh, an object that possesses the property of being red. Uh, so the point there is simply that things possess properties. So if I, if there are conscious states and properties that are non-physical, then what possesses them? And if I, and as I would argue, have touched on arguing, if it's not the brain that can't house or possess these things, what is it that possesses these immaterial states and properties of consciousness? I would say that you would need something like an immaterial substance to possess these things. Now, as far as a soul, I, I would just let me just. There's about three or four arguments I can just at least mention of, of how I would argue for a soul because, like I said, so far it's been consciousness. Yeah. So I can do it by asking questions. Um, if you think you're the same person from one moment to the next in the strict sense, I, I don't mean like 
uh, today's a new day. I'm a new person. Or I don't mean like you, like in a poetic sense. I mean, if you're literally, if you committed a, a crime 10 years ago, and if you're just a brain and body and they just, you know, you replace almost every cell in your body 10 years you know, later, you can still be arrested if you're still the same person. But if you're not the same person, you tell the cops, look, you just found the evidence that was 10 years ago, but good luck. That Shannon Q doesn't exist. Go find her. But if you are the same person from one to the next, mm -hmm. I would say you must be something more than a physical brain and body. You must be a soul. If you believe that uh, men are not more intrinsically valuable or have more value than women, and if you don't believe that men are um, are more of persons than women, then you would have to uh, say what? that something like a... How are you? Why? Where, how does that follow? Oh, yeah, you right. need to elaborate on that. Why? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Explain yourself, Eric. <laughs> well, well, first, you would agree, right, that men are not more persons or valuable than women, correct? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the power of this argument here. So, so okay. we get into personhood. Mm -hmm. So I, I possess the property of being a person. Now, okay. when, when we talk about properties, there are degreed and non-degreed properties. So let me explain that. So a, a degreed property would be something like the property of being loud or hard. These can fluctuate and come in percentages or degrees that can be divided. Contrast that with a non-degreed property. The number two and the number six are both, both possess the property of being even, but the number six is not more even than the number two because right. non-degreed properties are all or nothing kind of things. They don't, you, you can't divide them, divide the properties. They can't come in percentages. They're all or nothing. There is or isn't. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at personhood, <clears throat> Personhood, this property is possessed and grounded in something. Now, if there is no soul, mm -hmm. and if we're just purely physical beings, then you would have to ground being a person in your physical makeup, uh, your, your mass and matter. But if that's the case, then personhood would be a degreed property, which means it could fluctuate and change dependent on the mass and matter that you have. So if men are typically larger than women, then they have more mass and matter than women, then it would follow that men if you ground personhood in the mass and matter, then having more mass and matter means you have you matter more. Now, if that's not I don't the think case, you're grounding it in the wrong matter, though. Like if you're grounding personhood in the brain, oh, okay, same not, problem. Not the body. Then <clears throat> sure. why is that the same problem? Is so this, you look at some. So you look at something like Dandy Walker syndrome, mm -hmm. right? Where where someone can be born with I think as little as they've had cases where someone's only born with ten percent of a brain. It's largely a cavity of fluid. Let me ask you this question. Are they still persons? Uh, I would say yes, because there's something that it's like to be them. They experience, um, okay. they experience are they, existence. So are they 10% persons or are they still full human persons? Uh, they're full persons because if you, if, if you describe personhood as experiencing existence, like being aware of your own existence, like being in a human body and experiencing your own existence, then it doesn't need any other properties to be attributed to it. Um, in order okay. to be dawned on somebody, right? right? So, so that, sure. I mean, yeah, I, I, that's for the sake of argument, I'd say, let, let's go with that. The point, the, nevertheless, the point is that then you cannot ground it in the massive matter of the brain either. Why? So personhood can't be grounded. Well, because if, if, if you have a hundred percent of your brain and someone has 10% of a brain, then if y'all are both 100% persons and it follows that personhood isn't grounded in a, in the mass and matter of the brain. Why? Why not though? Because they're 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 still they they may not be able to function as optimally as me because they don't have mm -hmm. uh as much in the way of cognitive faculties in order to be able to you know manipulate their environment communicate things. But if they have enough of the brain that there is something that it's like to be them and they can experience existence and that is what we decide is personhood then okay. it's still grounded in the brain because they have enough of the brain for to be alive and experience existence. And the rest of it is just arbitrary designations that we give and dawn upon each other in order to just determine who is or is not more valuable based on intellectual assumptions and blah, 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 blah. Right. So, so, so I think you're agreeing with me in the sense that, no, you're not going to put a ratio of mass and matter of a brain to how much of a person is. But no. I think then you're instead going to the experiences. But I think the same rule, uh, the same principle would apply. If if someone who is five years old versus someone like me or you, we've had much, many more experiences than the person who's five. Are we more of persons than them? No, and why I, I does think, it need to be in degrees? Why is it like, can't it just be right, exist, no. experience, existence? 
Yeah, no, I that that that's the point. So if it's yeah. not a degreed property, then it cannot be based on anything that e- that can come in degrees like memory, perception, or the physical brain and body, because those things can come in degrees. So awesome. if personhood doesn't come in degrees, then you cannot base it on something or in something that does in fact come in degrees. But wouldn't that just be so being a person would be, well, we'll go back to tables. I'll use the table again, just because why not, right? We're using tables. Let's just keep using tables. So a table isn't any less a table because, you know, I, I put, I bedazzle it with some crap, right? It still exists as a table. Like you might say, that's a better table. That's a fancier table. This table is going to be more useful to me. This table seems like a sturdier table, but they're all tables like there we wouldn't revoke their tableness because one of them was slightly fancier than the other one of them matched our furniture better one of them looked like it would hold the amount of stuff we wanted it to hold we'd still they'd, they'd all still be assigned the attribute of table because they have sure. tableness is a component of their existence the same thing could happen like following this logic to humans like there is like 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 i said my buck stops at has experiences and is aware of existence and in human, you know, DNA meat bag equals sure. <laughs> equals person. Um, then the rest of it is just, um, I don't know. I don't know if I want to use the word degrees because I feel like it has philosophical implement implications that I'm not aware of because I'm completely inept at psycho at philosophy. Um, but it would just be differing versions of persons. Like being a person doesn't mean that you're identical to every other person. You're, you're going to be a different version of a person because you're a unique individual person. So what does the amount of your memories or experiences or the size of your body or the size of your brain have to do with anything? Well, I, I'm saying if it's not that, then it's not a degree of property. But we agree it's not a degree of property. But, but okay. you, mentioned something, you said something like tables. Remember, yeah. though. Those are those are aggregates, as as I've described in my position. Okay. So, in a, if I let's say I get I get two tables, right, and I cut I cut it down the middle. Yeah. How many halves do I have? If you have two tables, and I cut it down the middle, and you uh, cut it down the middle, like you're cutting one table. I cut both of them down the middle. Oh, how many halves do you have? Uh, one, two, three, four. So there's fifty percent. There's four fifty percent, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so it makes sense to say you have 50% of a table, but if you cut me in half, my arms and legs, you're not going to say you have 50% of a person. But not because we're boop doop doo up here. Okay, sure. So let's do the same thing there. Let's say, again, Danny Walker syndrome, someone yeah. born with only 50% of a brain. Yeah. They're not 50% of a person. So it's right. disanalogous between, right, because it's disanalogous between you could have half a table because those kind of purely physical objects, they can come in percentages or degrees. Yeah. But persons, even with half a, quote, body or half a brain, if they're still 100% persons, then it follows we are not purely physical objects. We must be something more, immaterial substance, namely the soul. But still, you no longer have a table in that scenario. You have, you've done, like, that's no longer a table. It doesn't exist as a table anymore once you cut well, it in half, right? Is that what you're saying? So, Well, well re- remember, we, we've already talked about the arbitrary external imposition of calling it a table based on its functionality. So these things don't even have intrinsic type of identities or natures that's different than a human but being the cool thing is though like if i cut your brain in half down the corpus colossum you could essentially have two versions of you in yeah your no, and it would, like you could it, have two separate would, identities because your brain no longer is able to communicate back and forth and this side of the brain and this side of the brain only has a little teeny bit of midbrain in order to be able to communicate and it's not built for that communication structure corpus colossum is what does that and i could cut it in half and you could have two different experiences of being eric in your head by cutting it in half like so the analogy doesn't work for me because now I don't have well, a table. Now I just have a bu- I have I have what used to be a table that is now a bunch of, a pile of crap on the floor. Like you cut my arm off, I'm still going to be me because I'm housed in here as far as I'm concerned. And if but but if you cut this in half the right way, there's going to be two of me. If you cut it in half the wrong way, there's going to be none of me. There will be zero of me. I'm done. I'm gone. Well, I, I, of course, as you know, I'm a Christian. I wouldn't say you're gone. Uh, well, but, I but, probably would be, though. Just saying. So, so, so a few things, though. Um, so it doesn't have to be a table. You can name. You, you can talk about right. a door. You can, you can, you can get a door and cut it in half, and it, it could still function as a door. So you could still have like half a door. Okay. Um, 
And, and about, gosh, what did you mention? It's my medicine has worn way off by this time. Of, oh, this I'm time sorry. I, we're talking no. too much. We'll, get, we'll no, finish no, no. your thought here and then we'll, then we'll get to the super chats. I'm very sorry. This is just really no, oh, cool. You, yeah, yeah, no. Okay, so perfect. Split brain. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Um, so a few things there. So first, I wouldn't say, no, you don't have two identities or personalities. Um, th there's a lot to be said there. If, if, I'm, if I'm looking straight and I cover one eye, uh -huh. I would see a slightly different shade of what I'm looking at at a different angle. And if I cover the other eye, I'm looking at a different shade because there's like some type of a, a color difference um, and a different angle. Yeah. When I do that, am I two persons with two perspectives? Oh, no, because do you know how your visual processing works? It's really cool, actually. You have an optic chiasm yes. in the middle of your brain. So like your optic nerve actually splits off. So everything that's on your right visual field is processed on the left side. Everything that's on the left side processed on the right side. And then it flips over. So everything we see is upside down, mm -hmm. backwards, and full of holes anyway. So right. when you like when you close your eye, you have a unified perceptual experience that happens. So like me covering my eye may may give me a perceptual difference in, in my visual field just simply because I'm only seeing it with the rods and cones on the fovea of this eye. And my brain, once my occipital lobe gets it, is actually <clears throat> reconstructing the image based on previous perspective in order to um, make that image whole as though both eyes were open. So your brain does all of the hard work of making it seem like both eyes were open. So you aren't half of you because you're actually receiving in both hemispheres information from this one eye. Sure, but so, but if I could, so, so no, right? I'm not. It's no. not two different. Things. I, mean, no. I just love visual right. processing. No, it's, it's good. No, no, and, and, yeah, right, and, and it's fascinating stuff. Okay. Now, when you cut the corpus callosum in half, uh, you, you sever it, right? So they, they, right. they use these two hemispheres. There's a few things about this. So first of all, um, the, the the these kind of phenomenons that happen when you look at these split brain experiments only happen while the person is having the this this type of experiment going on. When the person gets in his car and goes home, it, it's not it's not the same kind of story. Um, so they have to isolate something and they have to like, you know, uh, you can look at the test the way it's done. It's interesting. Um, on top of that, I would say this wouldn't disprove this wouldn't have anything to do with identity to change the uh, immaterial nature of consciousness or the fact that I personhood is not a degree of property um, at, at best. What you can say, because what people usually bring up when they say this uh, is something like, well, what about one half of the brain's atheist, one half of the brain is theist, which one goes to heaven, which one goes to hell. Ha ha ha. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, None of it touches any of the arguments that I've ever used for the soul. And on top of that, I'd say this. So if, if there is a soul, for the sake of argument, and if consciousness is non-physical and it is contained in the soul, okay. then it's, it's, it's not hard to conceive and even be expected that if, let's suppose one hemisphere of my brain is associated with my doubt and questions, and another hemisphere of my brain is associated with the answers that I have. If you limit my soul's ability to access one part of the hemisphere that is correlated with the answers versus another part of the hemisphere that is correlated with the doubt, then sure, when you only allow me to, to function within that hemisphere that has a doubt, I may be a, quote, atheist, but when you allow me to get to the answers, I may be a theist. It's like... <laughs> I love I, the way you couched that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> when, I, when I get to the answers, I may be a theist. That's funny. Okay, sorry. Go so, ahead. So, like, just, so, like, if I hit you... If, if God forbid you were get hit on the, over the head and you lost your memory, yeah. you're not a different Shannon. You're still Shannon. And then when you get your memory back, you're not another different Shannon. So it's kind of the same concept. When you isolate parts of the brain and, and limit my soul's access to other parts of the brain that are correlated with different things, again, just like a guitar. If you don't let me play the, the, the bottom three strings, there's, I'm not going to be able to play some notes. So I, I, while it's interesting and fascinating – it, it does nothing to touch on whether or not there's more than, quote, more than one soul. You still have, if my position is correct, an immaterial substance operating through a body. Cool. Okay. I will, I could, I could just keep going. I'm not going to, though, because I, there's people just flurrying in questions. So I'm going to actually ask them. <laughs> okay. So the first one is uh, from Bob. Thanks, Bob. Hi. Um, so if John Smith was a good God-believing Christian before the accident and now is an atheist after the accident, where does the soul go? And I think actually you kind of just gave your answer to that question uh, a bit. Did you want to elaborate more? Uh, yeah, sure. No, it, so, so this gives it a few things because one, I don't want to open up another can of worms, but I'll, I'll say this. Uh, what, another argument I use for the soul is free will. And another argument that I think you'd be fascinated to hear about, which maybe we can touch on later, is what's called the argument from the unified visual field, which I think you would really like by Ooh. someone named... Uh, is a philosopher named Eric LaRock, who's a philosopher and studied neuroscience. Yeah. Um, but but I, I can get to that later. But to answer the question here, 
So if you have free will, then whatever decisions you make are still going to be up to you. Um, that being said, if whether he had the accident or not, if he has what he needs um, to know whether or not God exists and rejects that and rejects Christ, then sure, yeah, he's going to hell, right? I mean, it's not like, uh, you know, because something happened, you, you know, you get a free pass for your free will. However, uh, there are other cases that I think much harder questions than that, you know, with people who are perhaps handicapped, which I would admit, yeah, these are kind of hard questions. I would say, I would say this, if assuming my worldview is true, then I'm perfectly fine with leaving it up to God who would know. So I, I believe in something called Molinism, which means that God knows the truth of every counterfactual situation of every single possibility. So I leave it up to God to say, you know what, this did happen. But I also knew that had this not happened, you would have remained a believer, whatever the case. Yeah, I'm going to let you in. Or he could say, well, you use your free will to do this and that. And even if you hadn't had this, you still would have not believed. I'm not going to let you in. I think he'd be just either way, and I think I'd, it, it's one of those things where it's above my pay grade, and if God is omniscient and all-knowing and knows every counterfactual, then I trust you know, he knows what to do in that situation, okay. even if I don't. I am going to move on to the next one. Oh, guys, be nice to people. <laughs> be nice to people. Uh, I'm going to read this because I don't think it's super mean. Eric destroyed poor atheist Skylar last night. We try to be nice here and... So anyway, I didn't watch it, but apparently somebody is on your team. Well, hello. <laughs> so, well, there, there are a lot of atheists who are saying something similar, so they, oh. they might not necessarily be on my team. But. Oh, well, I'll have to watch it. I'll have to go give it a lot. I didn't have a chance last night. I was, bu I was busy playing Cards Against Humanity with my friends on Zoom and drinking more alcohol than it was reasonable for me to do. But I'm not, so, so, I did that last night instead of watching, but it is in my queue. Um, <laughs> D-Style Boxing. Hi, D-Style Boxing. Um, I want to believe that there's a soul, but who knows if there is a soul? And again, from D-Style Boxing, I don't know. I'm not convinced. I'm not super convinced either, but I don't think I convinced Eric either. So I don't think either of us... <laughs> Want any want any souls this evening? Um, from <laughs> uh, on Andrew Botella, my computer is streaming a video from YouTube and showing it on the screen, but no semiconductor or LCD D pixel in the screen is doing that. Oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah, same sort of thing. Yeah. I thought, so I thought about that when you mentioned your phone in the car, and you were like, "My phone is in the car. You can see it." But yet, like your contacts are in your phone. And I feel the same way, kind of about memories, like. Yeah. So, uh, so a few things. Well, well first I'd say about the, the soul the, to the previous uh, super chat, you know, it wasn't a question. I, I didn't, I didn't really give a case for the soul. It was more like, you know, talking about our beliefs and getting clarification. Yeah. So it wasn't like I'm debating you and here's my case for the soul. If you do want that though, you can go to my channel and there's, a, I do like a two hour discussion where I give essentially my full case for the soul. We get into a lot of the metaphysics of it um, to the other thing. Yeah. So, so good point. Right. That that's exactly right. So what that shows is a few things. One is that, if, I, if, if you were to get so mad at me, you punch your screen with my image on it, you're not punching me, which shows that I am not identical to the screen. So first, it's two different things. And yes, while a single pixel doesn't have me on it, exactly right. It's the entire aggregate collection of it. And that's, that's kind of the point. You have a difference between a substance and an aggregate. If you were to, if you were to take out some components of this computer, or the screen or the pixels, you're not going to have a full picture. And you can't really say that's, that's an accurate image of me. Um, uh, so it, it goes to show that, yes, these are aggregates. Um, but the point is, if you're going to say consciousness is not you, but and not even to the questioner, but if someone's going to say consciousness is an aggregate of a collection of neurons, then I just kind of go back to what we said earlier where we talked about structural properties. You're not going to rearrange a million and three red bricks and then add a million and four, rearrange a structure, and it's now a blue house instead of a red brick house. It's structural properties – aren't going to give you an explanation for something like consciousness. So do we have like a different standard of continuity when it comes to what it is to be a person? Because I mean, inarguably like you change, right? Your thoughts change over time. Your positions change over time. You gain perspective. <clears throat> so we could, uh, this is probably going to open up a can of worms. We're going to end up talking for longer, but it just seems like when you reference the picture, like clearly that's not an accurate picture of you, right? Like, but if I take out one pixel, I can still make out that that's you. Could it be the sure. same sort of thing with, you know, a, a mild head trauma might be something that's enough that I, I can still be me. I can make out that it's me, 
but you know, a component that comprised me is missing. It's not quite the same. I'm not quite the same me as I was before, the same way that if you remove a couple of pixels, I can still make out it's you on the screen. Sure. But it's not quite the same you <clears throat> as yeah, so, it was prior. Not speaking of a quality, just, you know, the, the, the difference in the continuity. So, yeah, so, so a few things a few things to be said there. Um, to, to just kind of retouch on what I, what I said earlier, yeah. that's in part the argument that, that if I am more than just an if, I'm not reducible to a brain and body aggregate, mm -hmm. then it follows that if I remain identity through change throughout part replacement, then I am not identical to, reducible to, nothing more than a brain and body. I must be something more, namely an immaterial substance, a soul. So e even the very notion of change presupposes sameness. So um, when, I, when I look at two people, I look at one person and I turn to my right and see another person. I don't say this person changed. I say there's two different people. But when I go through life and I look at myself at five and myself at 10 and myself now, I say it's the same person underlining the change throughout these different memories, part replacements and changes. So if change is even possible, there has to be something that exists that maintains that identity throughout the change of part replacement. And if it can't be the brain, it can't be the body, if it can't be the memories, it must be something beyond transcendent to that. So hence it's I'm either a purely physical substance or I'm an immaterial substance. Isn't that and like I a would ship say, of Theseus type problem? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yep. See, I knew I know like three to four things about philosophy. <laughs> That's one of them. <laughs> All right. So we will go to the next one. That's a good question. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, Daniel Davis just sent me, oh my gosh, I have stickers. Oh, this adorable fox and he's laughing. That's I don't know how to read that. Adorable fox laughing. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> uh, Fred. Uh, where in my body is my soul contained? Define immaterial. Is there a valid difference between immaterial and non-existent? Wow, there's a lot in that super chat. Thank you. Yeah. Fred. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So, um, so where's my soul? So that that already assumes some. So, let will put it this way: we can say that physical things are things that would have something like that can be described exhaustively in in the terms of chemistry and physics, using those kind of languages. Uh, something that's physical is going to have a mass, going to have a shape, going to have a size, going to have a location. Something that's not physical is not going to have that. So no offense to the questioner, I don't mean this to be rude, but if you're asking where is the soul located, it already shows your misconception of what it means to be a material in the first place. Again, it's like asking if, if the number two existed, where is it? Give me the GPS coordinates and how many can you fit in your pocket? Um, so if the soul is a material, it doesn't have a quote physical location, though it is correlated with the physical body. Um, what was the other thing? Uh, immaterial, I kind of already went on that definition. If, if When you're looking at something that doesn't have mass and matter and doesn't have a location, you know, I, there's more to it. But I say that it's a good starting point without getting too deep into the weeds and taking up much more time. But um, we, we can... Boy, I, I don't want to say someone's going to open another can of worms, but I'll just say this. So I don't think color is material. Well, I think it's the same, just like, just like the brain can affect the soul. And I think it's vice versa. That's something we didn't even get into pretty well because gosh, there's a lot we didn't touch on. You're going to have to come back to sometime. <laughs> yeah. But so, when we look at something like cognitive behavioral therapy and we look at neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. we see that if I have habitual thoughts that are induced upon me, but uh, in a deterministic way by my physical brain and body and the chemistry, cognitive behavioral therapy in essence tells you to go against and challenge those thoughts. Now, I would argue, and I'm, I'm not going to have time to get into the argument, but if you're just a physical thing, I would argue there's no free will. In order to have free will, you have to be more than something physical. Well, and I think neuroplasticity would, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy lends credence to this because in order for me to go against my habitual deterministic thoughts that are induced upon me by my brain and body chemistry, then I must be something more than that in order to override those things that are being induced upon me and have the freedom to go against that physical deterministic way of thinking. Um, and back to the colors, so I would say something like color isn't, isn't physical. We know that some properties aren't physical. The property of being even isn't physical. Um, I would say something like time isn't something that's physical. Uh, uh, and why do I say colors aren't physical? Because people might argue, well, you need light to see color and photons and whatnot. No, you can close your eyes and picture a pink elephant, and there's no light in your mind. Right. I agree with that. It's a, that, that brought up more questions to me, though. Always yeah, I'm with sorry. more it's, questions. It's so I just got distracted. Squirrel. Um, so what's, a, what's an interesting question to me, and I don't think we covered it, and I probably should have brought it up earlier, is 
you're essentially saying, and it goes towards the last component of his question, like, what's the difference between immaterial and non-existent? Oh, yes, um, right. Right? And <clears throat> so when you're positing a soul, what by what mechanism does a soul interact with the brain and the brain vice versa? But that's something that struggles. <clears throat> that's why it just seems like an unnecessary step to me. I had yeah. other questions that were brought up by it but that was the last one that came to my mind and it was sparked by him saying what's the difference between immaterial and non-existent um, right so a difference between immaterial and non-existent so um so I, so if if i can just give a brief case for why mm -hmm. i would say that that consciousness is not physical um so in fact i i use this as an argument i said i would argue and again I'm, I'm having to weigh the explanations but to give you my train of thought i would argue if atheism is true there's no god then consciousness must be reducible to something physical like the brain or uh, like something like the brain but if consciousness is not physical and if that's what atheism would entail then if consciousness exists and is not physical then atheism can't be true so um why do i think consciousness is not physical going back to what's called Leibniz's law of identity uh the relationship of identity if if x is the same thing as y then whatever's true of x is true of y um i often use an example of looking at two clear fluids in a lab one labeled water one labeled chemical x are they identical well do they share the same properties and uh, i turn over chemical x it says caution flammable and i think ah even if i don't know what chemical x is i know it can't be the same thing as water because it has a property of being combustible water doesn't therefore they're not the same thing when you look at the properties and states of the mind and look at the properties of the states of the brain if they are identical the same thing and we're just using two different names to refer to the same thing they're going to share the same properties but they don't and this might open up more questions and i'm fine with that my thoughts can be true or false my neurons are not true or false my brain can weigh three pounds the thought that i'm talking to you doesn't weigh three pounds my brain can be seven inches long but the taste of a banana or the smell of a rose is not seven inches long i can give a dozen more examples but if all the properties of the mind are not physical and all the properties of the brain are physical then it follows that if consciousness exists it can't be physical and if you're going to say it, it, not to the questioner, but if someone says, because I've heard people say, well, if it's immaterial, it's the same thing as saying it doesn't exist. No, because I would argue consciousness is immaterial, and I'm certainly conscious. Right. Okay. That's fair to me. I just remembered the other thing, and then I'll get to the other question. Like when you were talking about, um, I can't remember which experiments that you said you were looking at, but you brought up free will. Mm -hmm. um, and that made me think about like the lie bed experiments. Have you ever read the lie bed experiments? Mm -hmm. It's not fair to have discussions about them, I guess, if you haven't read them. But yep. those are something that was really compelling to me when it came to looking at the case, the case for, for free will and the brain, like your awareness of something happening after your brain has already instantiated <clears throat> that process. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would mm -hmm. disagree with that because how do you look at awareness? What, what you, what you, when you look at the brain, you don't see consciousness. You don't, right, right. So when you look at the brain, you don't see consciousness. No. And there is also something to it that prior to making it – so there are different orders of awareness. You have a first-order awareness and a second-order awareness. So right now, in my first-order awareness, I'm looking at my, my camera here. I'm looking at what's in front of me. But the entire time, there's also been a door over here. There's been you know uh, shoes over here on the floor you know, that I have to clean up, and my wife, so my wife won't be mad at me. But in other words, these were in my peripheral, but not in my first order awareness. People experience this all the time when they drive. If you know you drive from point A to point B, and I say, "Hey, Shannon, how many cars were there, and what colors were they?" You'd be like, "Oh, I, I wasn't paying attention." Yeah. It's because it wasn't in your first order awareness. So there's different levels of awareness. So. When, I re when people are reporting, it's, it's quite likely they're reporting first and foremost their first order awareness, their awareness of their awareness. Because if there is a soul, there's, there's a, a time where you're processing a lot of things. For example, if I need to report to you when I'm aware of something, yeah. there's first the I'm aware, then I'm aware of my awareness, and then I'm, I'm forming – the thought I need to report this to this person, then I'm aware of that, and then I'm reporting it to it, and I'm aware of me and myself reporting to it. So there's a lot of stages going on there. Well, they weren't um, self-reporting like that, actually. They were raising um, hands, I think, or noting right, a clock. Yes. It depends on yep, which version of it that you've looked at. Um, yep. So when you say right, to so, me, aware of my <laughs> awareness, that gets mm -hmm. me, like, because you either... I understand what you're saying about, you know, peripheral awareness when it comes to perception. Like, that, that is all hunky dory with me like i get all of that because you have like a proximal distal stimuli right so you're 
you have something that you're attending to, yeah. your perception of what you're attending to, and everything else that's outside of your perceptual field that you're not particularly attending to is something that our brains are geared to only necessarily be aware of if something dramatic happens. Like, so if some, like, if, if I'm looking at this computer, I'm focused on this computer, I'm focused on you, there's things in my periphery that are that, that exist, but I'm not specifically taking note of because they're not the point of my focus. But if something slams behind me, it's going to take my awareness towards sure. it. If something rushes past me, I'm likely <clears throat> to dart my eyes towards it. But they're in the periphery. So I, I completely sure. understand that. But when you're, when you're, I'm aware of these surroundings already because I'm receiving this information. Now this went the other way. Like, so this is a perceptual field that I'm aware of. Like I'm aware of my sound sure. and the olfactory and all of that stuff. Now in this instance, you were having a perception. So you were looking at a clock or they were playing a game, like a hand raising game. And they were taking note of when they were aware of, uh, I can't remember the exact task, like one task where they were doing a, a hand raising game to try to, <laughs> Mm -hmm. They're looking at the match. clock and yeah. Yeah, because there, there's two versions. One actually mm -hmm. matched directly onto pe epileptic patients and put the neural net right on the brain and they put the screen behind them and the screen would project the arrow of the direction their hand was going to raise before they raised their hand. So they didn't even have to self-report. The screen was predicting what their movements were going to be, uh, which was really cool. But it was an uh, epileptic patient that had a, a seizure treatment that had brain surgery that had a neural map placed uh, directly on their, on their cortices. Um, but aware of awareness is the issue to me because they demonstrated that there was a, that an action potential taking place and then the action took place and they reported their awareness by looking, by noting the time on the clock that they saw as their point of awareness. And that's how they did the self-referential. And mm -hmm. what do you like? So when you say aware of awareness, it seems as though you're saying that the action potential in your brain is something you were aware of, even though you weren't aware of it. And I don't know what the justification for that is, because what so, is awareness then? Like, awareness just doesn't mean anything anymore to me. Well, so, 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 so a, few thing, a few things here. Um, first and foremost, I'd say looking at the brain doesn't necessarily, you're not looking at consciousness, right? So no. um, I guess not. With, with, I, I guess to, to explain the aware, aware of awareness, um, if I were to introspect right now and just kind of contemplate on my mental states, yeah. I can start to, I can start to think and like, you know what is, it, it is a little bit hot in here. Um, you know, there, there's an itch on the left side of my foot. Uh, the shoes I'm wearing, you know, are getting a little bit sweaty, but while that has been happening the whole time, it's not as if I was aware. I, I was aware of that in the sense that it's not as if I thought I didn't have any legs. It's not as if I was like um, handicapped, you know, from, from the waist down or something. I was aware of it the entire time. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't aware of my awareness. Um, Those are perceptual experiences, though. So like in this type, well, we were well, talking about sure. having the idea to do something. Right. So so when you have so there you have thoughts and you have thoughts about your thoughts. Right. Yeah. Um, and in order for me to articulate my awareness, I have to be aware of my awareness. Does that make sense? No, I don't think I'm going to get it to make sense to me right now. <laughs> like, you have to be aware of your experiences so that, or aware sure. of your perceptions for sure. So maybe uh -huh. we're just utilizing it differently. Like awareness would be – maybe we are just utilizing it differently to me. And, and, and I'll just say this too about the free will thing. The, the irony – because there's, there's a lot that can be said about free will. But the irony yeah. about it is that the very people conducting the experiment are assuming by in principle that the people that are reporting to them when they're – aware of this are assuming that they have the freedom in the first place to report whether or not they're free in the first place. So in order to study whether or not freedom exists, you have to assume the person you're studying has the freedom to report it to you and is not determined to report something differently. Well, I mean, they could be lying. That's a, that's a serious problem with self-report and psychology. I'm going to ask the next question. So this is what I do. I get selfish. <laughs> I want to talk about stuff. All right. So this is for Michael. Hi, Michael. Thank you uh, for $5. So Eric, where are memories stored if not in the brain? In the soul. Mic drop. <laughs> in the soul. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Apollo, Jedi. Apollo is very. And, well, let me say something else, too. That, that assumes memories must be physically stored somewhere, too, which I reject. So the, the question has a presupposition I don't agree with, and I, and I stand by my answer. All right. I'll allow it. <laughs> All right. Apollo, Jedi again. Apollo, Jedi. Uh, <laughs> 
goodness gracious. T jump is getting P W N E D. Is that point point point? I'm too old. But right now, L O L, all caps lock. Guys, be nice. I don't want to read any more of those. Please don't. Like the, they're on the fence for me. Be nice to each other. Um, hey T jump, I guess he's in the live chat. Hi T jump. I if you are in the live chat. He and I talked about the soul. Yeah, I like T jump. Some, sometimes yeah. he frustrates me because I feel like sometimes that he's just an antagonist for the sake of seeing what will happen. And I think that's just how he is. <laughs> I think that is just who he is. Yeah, I think Tom definitely jumps to conclusions sometimes. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Dad, know. It's a dad joke. It was a bad dad joke. Oh, oh okay. Like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and the last one is from Puck. I don't have anything specific. Just thank you for doing what you do. Oh, thank you, Puck. It's nice. I ended on a nice one. All right. So uh, we've been at it for an hour and a half. I've monopolized your time entirely longer than I'd anticipated. Well, actually, I, pro I, I had a feeling this might happen. But... What would you like to leave everybody with before we go? Your links are in the description, uh, or your link, I should say, to the conversation that you had on the radio. Sorry, there was a fly. And were you waving at? So there was a fly that I was trying. I was trying to get out of my life. There's a soul bite. <laughs> That's right. That was just a fly. Um. So yeah. So let everybody know who you are, where they can find you. Check his links out down in the description and say your parting, your parting words. Yeah. Uh, 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 Eric Hernandez. You can go on Facebook. Type in Eric. Hernandez TXB Ministries YouTube channel. It's well, you can just find the link in the description. Um, but but I would like to, to do this if you don't mind. Um, yeah, yeah. Usually, even though this is not a debate, one thing I've I've tried to make it my aim to do is when I have a debate or discussion with a non-believer, I usually ask uh, a question. If it's a debate, I'm asking, "What's your biggest objection?" and let me buy a book for you. And the second question I ask is, "Can I pray with you?" Given it's not a debate, I still want to ask the second part: "Can I pray with you online?" Uh, you can absolutely pray. Uh, I will respectfully. Um, allow the allow the moment if if you'd like to do it now. I likely won't participate because I am an atheist and I don't think <laughs> right, that right. It, it would just be performative. Uh, it would be a performative show of respect, and I think that I respect you enough uh, for right, you yeah. to know that it would just be performative. Absolutely, but I would absolutely. Right. So I, I don't want to insult you by just performing for the sake of placating. No, no, no yeah, no, I, I would right? expect you. <laughs> yeah. It'd be great if you, you right now. Yeah. Uh, in other words, in place of me giving anything closing, I'd just rather do that. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this time uh, that, that I've been able to be on with Shannon, Father. I, I thank you for, for her life, Lord. And, and I was about to say ministry, but, you know, I thank you for what she does, Father. I, I pray that... Um, the, the genuine heart that she has, I pray that as she seeks, Lord, that you would you would reveal things to her, Father, that you would uh, bring the right people uh, to her, that you would help her in any kind of doubts or anything like that. And I, and I thank you, Lord, that uh, just just for creating her and, and ask that you would bless her life, Father. You would bless what she does, her children, and again, that you would just be close to her and that when she does seek you and, and when she does look for answers in, in an honest, genuine way, Lord, I, I pray that you would you would be there, Father God, and give those right responses. We, we thank you again just for what she does and who she is. In your name we pray. Amen. I would like to close by saying that I appreciate all of the sentiments that you wish for me in that scenario and all of the positive things that uh, you said about me uh, as you were praying. So I thank you for those. And the spirit in which they were intended is something that means something to me. And I receive them um, as such. So thank you for that. And I hope you felt respected and listened to and that you enjoyed the conversation and will potentially Absolutely. join us at some point in time again. So... I always end by putting up an end card screen. I don't have any music, so everybody just gets to look at it for 20 seconds because that's how long it takes so that I can put up my, uh, my cards. And before I go, I always say, as always, everybody, help elevate the discourse. Bye, guys. I'm waving, but you nobody can see me because there's an end card up. <laughs> <laughs>